Waverly, how are you? All right, look very important. Uh, I got the tip on the desk in the small white space. And then this is just the one that we talked about. Yeah, this is the one that we talked about. If our guests could please be seated so we can begin. The Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations will now come to order. Today, the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations is holding a hearing entitled Undermining Mercury Protections, EPA Endangers Human Health and the Environment. The purpose of today's hearing is to examine the Environmental Protection Agency's recent proposal that says limiting mercury and other toxics from coal and oil-fired power plants is not, quote, appropriate and necessary under the Clean Air Act. The Chair will now recognize herself for purposes of an opening statement. Today, we take a look at the Trump administration's ill-conceived and, to me, frankly, mind-boggling effort to undermine the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's rule that limits mercury emissions from our nation's coal-powered plants. Mercury is one of the most toxic substances on the planet, and it's one that causes real harm to the brain, heart, and other essential body systems. Despite the dangers that toxic metals can cause, for years, there were no federal regulations limiting how much mercury that our coal-fired power plants could emit into the atmosphere each year. Let me be clear about something. When the EPA fails to enact clean air protections, it's our communities, it's our families, and our environment that all pay the price. And when an administration, like today's administration, tries to unravel the protections that we have gotten, it puts all of us at risk. In 2012, to address this issue and better protect the public from the threat posed by mercury emissions, the Obama administration determined that it was, quote, appropriate and necessary under the Clean Air Act to limit how much mercury coal power plants could emit each year. The Obama administration finalized these new standards in a new rule enacted that year known as the Mercury and Air Toxic Standards, or MATS. In justifying its, its decision to enact these new limits, the Obama administration estimated while it would cost industry more than $9 billion to comply with the new rule, the new standards would generate four to six million dollars direct health benefits and as much as 90 billion dollars in additional health benefits each year by reducing people's exposure to the toxic metal. Now the industry chose to challenge the standards in court, but they were left in place during the court challenge. The industry eventually moved forward and invested billions of dollars in new technology and pollution controls to comply with these standards. And the investments the companies made led to a significant drop in the amount of mercury and other harmful pollutants being emitted from the coal power plants across the country today. And that's why the Obama administration's so-called mercury rule has been hailed by advocates as such a success. But now, as I said earlier, the rule is under attack as the Trump administration is trying to not only undo this new mercury rule, but also to undermine the theory that it's appropriate and necessary for the agency to enact such rules in the first place. If the EPA was here today, 
I'm sure that they would tell this panel that we have nothing to worry about, that mercury standards will remain in effect regardless of their actions, and the only reason they're taking a look at this rule now is because they're required to do so by the Supreme Court. But of course, the EPA didn't come today, and so I'll just say um, what, what my perspective is. I don't think that would be true. The Supreme Court never told the Trump administration to revisit this rule. And the Supreme Court never told the EPA to enact a new policy that would ignore billions of dollars in health benefits going forward. The Trump administration is acting purely on its own initiative. Why, I don't know. What's clear is the Trump administration is doing more than simply revising the mercury rule. It's trying to set the EPA on an entirely new course going forward, one that requires the agency to ignore the real health benefits that our nation's environmental policies often provide to the public. I want to thank our witnesses for coming today. We have experts who will explain how the administration's new mercury <coughs> proposal contradicts the, quote, relevant guidance and decades of practice by administrations of both political parties. They'll explain how it ignores the very real benefit that comes from regulating the hazardous pollutants coming from our nation's power plants, and how the Trump administration is conveniently ignoring some key realities and important new information when arguing that the cost of these proposals greatly outweighs the benefits. For example, according to re recent studies, the annual direct benefit of regulating mercury could be in the billions, not the millions as originally estimated, and the total implementation cost for countries to come into compliance was actually much lower than was predicted. But you see, what's, what's the most puzzling is the timing, because in arguing the cost versus benefit of the mercury rule, the EPA seems to have forgotten the rule's been in place for years already. The industry's already complied, and if you undo the rule now, it would put the public's public's health at risk, and also the company's ability to recover the money they invested to comply. That's why some of the people who want to keep this rule in place is the power industry itself. So if I'm doing the rule would be bad for public health, bad for the environment, and bad for industry itself, who does it help? And why is the EPA pushing this? That's what I'm trying to understand. Now, um, uh, I, I, I just want to close briefly by saying that I, I'm continually frustrated and surprised by the administration's refusal to send witnesses to Congress. And the EPA's refusal to show up today is just another example of the efforts to block Congress from performing its oversight functions. And so we're going to have to move forward, but it would be really helpful if we had the agencies here to help us. And with that, I'm pleased to yield five minutes to the ranking member, Mr. Guthrie. Thank you, uh, Chair DeGette, and thank you for holding this important hearing. The Mercury Air Toxic Standards, MATS, was created to regulate mercury levels, and I think it's important to today's conversation to discuss where mercury comes from and how we in the United, United States are primarily exposed to it. Mercury can be released through human activities such as burning materials which contain mercury. It is also released into the atmosphere naturally through events such as volcanic eruptions, forest fires, and normal breakdown of minerals in rocks and soil. Mercury levels in certain areas can vary depending not only on how much mercury is released locally, but what can come, also come from regional, national, or even international sources due to wind and weather patterns. Once released into the atmosphere, mercury will eventually deposit into bodies of water or onto land, where it will also ultimately be transported into water. In the water, microorganisms can change the mercury into methylmercury, and the methylmercury will accumulate up the food chain into fish and sailfish. While exposure to mercury takes several forms, nearly all human exposure to methylmercury in the United States occurs through fish and shellfish consumption. The regulation we are discussing today, MATS, was intended to help reduce the amount of mercury created from human activity, specifically mercury emitted from coal and oil-fired electric utility steam plants generating units, uh, or EGUs. The creation of MATS dates back to 1990 Clean Air Act amendments, where the Environmental Protection Agency was required to conduct studies on coal and oil-fired EGUs to inform the EPA's decision whether it was appropriate and necessary to regulate EGUs under Section 112 of the Clean Air Act. After conducting multiple studies in 2000, the Clinton administration found that it was appropriate and necessary 
to regulate coal and oil-fired EGUs under the Clean Air Act, Section 112, and added EGUs to the Act's 112C list of source categories that must be regulated. MATS has had a lengthy and complex history across multiple administrations involving studies, proposed rules, final rules, cases before the D.C. Circuit, and a case before the Supreme Court in 2015, where the Supreme Court told EPA they had to consider cost when determining whether this regulation was appropriate and necessary, which EPA had not previously done. Most recently, in December, the EPA issued a, pose, a proposed rulemaking to, to the National Emission Standards for hazard, Hazardous Air Pollution, or, or NESHAP, for EGUs. In the rule, EPA made four proposals, makes four proposals to determine that it is not appropriate and necessary to regulate hazardous air pollutant emissions from coal and oil-fired EGUs plan under Section 112 of the Clean Air Act. To keep coal and oil-fired EGUs as a source category on the Clean Air Act Section 112C list of sources that must be regulated under 112D of the Act, thereby keeping the emission standards and other requirements of the MATS rule in place for coal and oil-fired power plants. To so, three, to solicit on whether the agency has the authority and or obligation to delist EGUs from Section 112C of the Act and rescind the niche app for coal and oil-fired EGUs, and four, to propose the, the results of the res, residual risk and technology review of niche app for coal and oil-fired EGUs. This proposed rule does not remove the standard. It only proposes to remove the appropriate necessary finding that almost entirely justified the cost of match regulation by the co-benefits of regulating particulate matter by which by Congress's design is regu regulated under a different section of the Act. Today's conversation examines a lot of very complex questions and I believe have potential significance beyond MATS. For example, was a, the appropriate and necessary finding that justified MATS sound was a regulation made under the right section of the Act and how should a regulatory body weigh co-benefits in crafting future regulations, et cetera. All of these questions are important, and I hope we can have a thorough and honest discussion to inform future rulemaking. I thank our witnesses for being here today. Uh, while it is unfortunate that EPA cannot be here today to testify as well, I hope the chair schedules a second hearing soon so the agency's perspective can be heard on these important issues. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank the ranking member. I'm now pleased to recognize the vice chair of the, full, of the oversight subcommittee, Mr. Kennedy, for five minutes for purposes of an opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Over the past two and a half years, the Trump administration has upheld its promise time and again to roll back critical environmental protections. Nearly every day, families and communities are at greater risk of losing access to clean air and clean water at the expense of political convenience. Since 2012, the EPA has written a success story for public health and the environment through its implementation of mercury and toxic air standards, MATS. One analysis by the EPA calculated the reduction level of 86% of mercury emissions from 2010 to 2017. Yet despite that success, EPA is now proposing to reverse its own findings and perhaps the entire MATS regulatory structure. Mercury can be highly toxic to infants, children, and adults, including severe consequences to heart, kidney, and immune system functions. Prenatal exposure can cause severe neurological damage that lasts a lifetime. Over the years, the EPA has taken steps to limit emissions of mercury from industrial sources like wastewater, waste incinerators and cement and brick production. In 2012, after extensive consultation with the power sector and other stakeholders, EPA finalized standards under the Clean Air Act to reduce emissions of mercury and other toxic air pollutants from coal-fired power plants. The final rule was quickly, quickly challenged in federal court by the coal industry, which argued that the EPA made a flawed determination that was, quote, appropriate and necessary to limit mercury emissions from power plants. The case made its way all the way to the Supreme Court, which held that the EPA should have considered cost when making its determination. In response to the Supreme Court's ruling in 2016, the EPA issued a supplemental finding which determined that the consideration of cost confirmed its prior determination that the regulation of mercury emissions was still, quote, appropriate and necessary. Throughout these legal challenges, the electric generating industry pursued regulatory compliance, spending billions of dollars on technologies to limit mercury and toxic, other toxic emissions, contributing to a nearly 90% decrease in mercury emissions in the past decade. According to the uh, excuse me, July 2018 letter from the electric industry to EPA, all covered power plants had uh, implemented the regulation and were operating pollution controls. Unfortunately, this past December, despite all the success and reductions of mercury emissions, 
Trump EPA issued a stunning reversal uh, by proposing it, no lo it is no longer, quote, appropriate and necessary, unquote, and to limit mercury emissions from power plants under the Clean Air Act. The EPA reached this conclusion by redoing the agency's cost-benefit analysis. In this new calculation, the agency disregarded the health and other benefits of reducing pollutants not directly targeted to mats, also known as co-benefits. With those benefits out of the picture, the EPA determined the cost of the rule greatly outweighed its benefits. The EPA, EPA and its, excuse me, the Trump EPA and its supporters claim that this new approach is reasonable and perhaps even legally required. But the former head of the EPA's Air and Radiation Office, who helped finalize this rule during the Obama administration, is here today and will say just the opposite. By doing what they are doing, the EPA is, quote, the Trump EPA is, quote, choosing to paint itself into this corner, end quote. The Trump EPA argues that its policy approach is rational because the pollutant reductions it ignores for purposes of MATS, the MATS rule, are regulated under a different provision under the Clean Air Act. But as you will hear today from one expert in the cost-benefit analysis, the Trump EPA approach is, quote, irrational, end quote, and further will result in a, quote, biased and misleading estimate of costs and benefits. Beyond its wrong-headed and unjustified approach to the cost-benefit analysis, the Trump EPA's proposed determination relies on an out-of-date record from 2011. We now know that the costs of the MATS rule are lower, and the direct benefits of mercury and air toxic, re toxic air reductions are much higher than indicated in the 2011 record. The Trump EPA conveniently disregards this information. Administrator Rit Wheeler is now working to justify this decision by claiming that the EPA is required to act by the Supreme Court. However, in truth, the EPA, EPA in the prior administration already responded to the Supreme Court's concerns. The new proposal is opposed by parents, by doctors, by nurses, by tribes, by faith leaders, and even by the regulated industry itself. Unfortunately, the EPA declined an invitation to attend this hearing to offer much, uh, a much needed explanation of its decision. For an agency under this administration that has demonstrated time and again that this, it is not serious about its mission, this dangerous and misleading proposal to undermine mercury and air toxic protection and toxic air protections is a new law and unnecessarily creates risks to both public health and the environment. Thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this important hearing, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Walden, for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Good morning, Madam Chair, and thanks for holding this important hearing. Mercury poisoning poses a serious risk to all children and to all adults especially pregnant women and infants. The mercury levels in certain areas depend on how much mercury is not only released locally, but also how much is released across the globe. The amount of mercury that travels across the globe is not insignificant. Some research suggests that about one-fifth of the mercury that enters the Willamette River in Oregon comes from abroad and oftentimes from China. So let's be clear, though, in the recent proposal, the EPA is not changing the emission standards and other requirements of the MATS rule for coal and oil-fired power plants. Indeed, the EPA explicitly says that their proposal is to keep power plants on the Clean Air Act Section 112C source list and not to change the existing emission standards promulgated in 2012. The decision to keep the existing emission standards in place for power plants makes sense, especially given that the industry has already complied with the MATS rule. The initial compliance date was over four years ago. Power plants have reduced mercury emissions by about 86 percent and reduced emissions of total hazardous air pollutants by 96 percent since 2010. These reductions have come at a large cost to the industry and to consumers. In their comments to the proposed rule, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce said the power sector spent about $18 billion on compliance controls thus far. So not only is it logical for the EPA to keep the existing emission standards in place for power plants, but also under a 2008 D.C. Circuit Court case, the EPA cannot change the existing emission standards unless they go through the extremely rigorous delisting process under Section 112C9 of the Clean Air Act. Given this precedent and how difficult it is to delist a source category from the Section 112C1 list of the Clean Air Act, I have questions for the witnesses today about the likelihood of this risk, especially since industry is already in compliance with the standards. Now, when the Obama administration first promulgated the MATS rule, they did not consider the cost of regulation, as you've already heard. Supreme Court in Michigan versus EPA clearly said that was wrong stating that the EPA must consider costs when determining whether it was appropriate and necessary to regulate power plants for HAPS. 
In response, the Obama administration issued a 2016 supplemental finding putting forth two cost approaches, a cost reasonableness test and a cost benefit analysis to determine it was appropriate and necessary to move forward. The EPA heavily relied on the co-benefit of reductions in particulate matter 2.5 in its cost benefit analysis with more than 99% of the benefits being co-benefits. The Obama administration's interpretation of how to consider costs is open to argument. Immediately after the 2016 supplemental finding was issued, it was challenged in court. This litigation is ongoing and the D.C. Circuit is currently holding the case in abeyance. The Trump administration's proposed rule revises the EPA's approach to the decision in Michigan versus EPA, and in the EPA's own words, and I quote, corrects flaws in the EPA's prior 2016 response to Michigan, close quote. The EPA calls into question the previous administration's heavy reliance on co-benefits to justify its appropriate and necessary finding. As Chief Justice John Roberts highlighted through his questioning during oral argument in Michigan, it is questionable whether a pollutant that already has its own regulatory framework under the Clean Air Act, such as PM 2.5, should be so heavily relied on as a co-benefit to justify a regulation of another type of pollutant. The EPA proposes instead to directly compare the cost of compliance with MATS with the benefits specifically associated with reducing emissions of HAP. The Clean Air Act is silent on whether or not the EPA should consider co-benefits in the rulemaking process. I remind my colleagues this body has the ability to change the law and statutorily determine whether and how co-benefits should be considered, but I've seen no bills introduced to do that to date. If Congress remains silent, as we have since 1990, then I strongly suspect that this issue will ultimately be determined by the Supreme Court. I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. It's my understanding that the majority did invite the EPA to testify today, and unfortunately the EPA declined that invitation, explaining they had a conflict and offered to come at a later date. I'm disappointed the EPA is not here today. They should be to explain their proposal and the reasons they have issued this proposed rule. So I hope we have a second hearing where they can attend. I would point out um, there have been other hearings where the majority has not invited the uh, administration to present uh, testimony, uh, made a decision to do that when we've asked them to, um, so it kind of goes both ways. But in this case, the EPA ought to be here. I'm with you, Madam Chair, and uh, we'll work with you to make sure they show up next time. With that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I now ask unanimous consent that the members' written opening statements be made part of the record without objection, so ordered. I now want to introduce the panel of witnesses for today's hearing. Ms. Janet McCabe, who's the former acting administrator of the Office of Air and Radiation, US EPA. Ms. Heather McTeer Tony, who's the National Field Director for Moms Clean Air Force. Mr. Michael Livermore, Associate Professor of Law at the University of Virginia. Uh, Dr. Noel eckley Celine, uh, PhD, Associate Professor at MIT, Director of the MIT Technology and Policy Program. Dr. Philip Landergan, MD, MSC, Director of Pub Global Public Health Program and Global Pollution Observatory at the Schiller Institute for Integrated Science and Society, Boston College. And Mr. Adam R. F. Gustafson, partner of Boyd Boyden Gray and Associates, PLLC. Thank you all for appearing before the subcommittee today. And I know you're aware that the committee is holding an investigative hearing. And when we do so, we take uh, testimony under oath. Does anyone have an objection to testifying today under oath? Seeing no objections, let the record reflect the witnesses have responded no. The chair then advises you under the rules of the House and the rules of the committee, you're entitled to be accompanied by counsel. Do any of you wish to be accompanied by counsel today? Let the record reflect the witnesses responded no. So if you please, if you would, please rise and raise your right hand so you may be sworn in. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect. The witnesses have responded affirmatively and they've been seated. 
Uh, you're now under oath and subject to the penalty set forth in Title 18, Section 1001 of the United States Code. Now the chair will recognize witnesses for five-minute opening statements. In front of you, you've got a microphone and a series of lights. The light turns yellow when you have a minute left and red to indicate your time has come to an end. And so, uh, Ms. McCabe, uh, you're first, and I'm pleased to recognize you now for five minutes. Thank you, Chair DeGette and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate being here today and note that I'm here in my personal capacity not representing Indiana University. EPA's proposal to withdraw the appropriate and necessary finding that underpins the MATS rule is of grave concern for three reasons. First, it provides the legal predicate for the eventual withdrawal of a rule that protects the most vulnerable among us from exposure to mercury and other harmful pollutants. It takes a radical new approach to consideration of health benefits that has implications far beyond this rule and it injects regulatory uncertainty into a program the industry has already complied with and does not want to be reopened. Mercury is extremely Excuse harmful. me, Ms. McCabe, is your mic on? The light is on. Okay, just move it a little closer. Perfect, thank you. Mercury is extremely, better? Okay. Mercury is extremely harmful to human health, especially babies and pregnant women and their unborn children. Prior to MATS, fossil-fired power plants were the single largest industrial emitter of mercury. In 1990, Congress adopted a technology-based approach to addressing emissions of air toxics from stationary sources. Because coal-fired power plants were already regulated through other programs, such as the acid rain program, Congress required EPA to evaluate whether it was appropriate and necessary to develop a rule for them. The EPA made that finding in 2000, but in 2005 reversed it, instead issuing a national mercury cap and trade program. The D.C. Circuit overturned that rule, leaving the Obama administration to address this ongoing regulatory obligation. EPA issued MATS and a new finding in 2011. EPA used the best information available and followed longstanding OMB guidance to project the cost and benefits of the rule. That meant considering the full range of health benefits, including reductions of all harmful air pollutants, monetized or not. As is often the case, the technologies EPA expected utilities would use to control mercury would also reduce other harmful air pollutants, such as fine particles. The health effects of these pollutants are significant, and these reductions were not already required by other programs. The D.C. Circuit fully upheld MATS. The Supreme Court agreed, except that it held that EPA should have considered cost as part of the appropriate and necessary finding itself. So the EPA issued a supplemental finding in 2016, looking at costs and benefits in several ways, and again concluding that MATS was appropriate and necessary. In the meantime, the industry implemented the rule and is now in compliance. Although EEI and others urged EPA not to change the appropriate and necessary finding or the provisions of MATS, EPA issued its proposed withdrawal earlier this year. EPA now proposes to conclude that the costs outweigh the benefits, looking at the very same information it considered in 2011 and 2015, but using a radically different approach to how it considers benefits. And while EPA presents this almost as if it has no choice, the agency is choosing to paint itself into this corner. First, despite saying that it is not proposing to rescind MATS, a rescission of the finding would create the legal predicate for the agency to do so or for outside parties to petition EPA to do so and sue them if they don't. EPA indeed seeks comment on this very question, and we're seeing public statements that indicate people believe that this is the first step to the repeal of MATS. Second, EPA proposes to reverse itself on the strength of a single highly significant policy change, that it's inappropriate to consider fully the health of benefits associated with any pollution reductions other than the air toxics specifically targeted by the rule. This approach ignores decades-old OMB guidance and years of agency practice that valued both direct and indirect benefits. It also ignores cause and effect realities and favors industry costs over public health benefits. The EPA's approach distorts cost-benefit analysis in ways that reasonable businesses would not do. Savvy businesses try to achieve multiple benefits when installing new equipment. One pollution control technology often accomplishes multiple purposes and helps with compliance beyond the specific rule that drives the initial investment. EPA is basing this revised analysis on a record that is demonstrably out of date. There's now information showing both that costs have been lower and benefits will be higher. If EPA is going to proactively reopen this rule and dramatically change its methodology, to willfully ignore the facts on the ground turns this into an academic exercise. Rulemaking under the Clean Air Act is not academic. These programs affect health and quality of life for millions of people. 
The proposal also unnecessarily creates uncertainty for utilities who have already complied. If the EPA reverses the finding, it will kick the legal legs out from under the standards themselves, and if the requirements go away, it may complicate rate recovery, or utilities may decide to operate their controls less, which would mean a return to higher mercury and other toxics in our communities. If EPA finalizes this rule, we can reasonably expect to see this approach to devaluing health benefits in every EPA proposal. This program has been a success. Mercury emissions from coal plants have gone down and mercury levels in water and fish have decreased. This program is in the rear view mirror for utilities and contrary to EPA's mission to protect public health and the environment, it should not be finalized. I apologize for going over. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Chair now recognizes Ms. McTeer Tony for five minutes. Chairwoman DeGette, Ranking Member Guthrie, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify about the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's mercury and air toxic standards. My name is Heather McTeer Tony. I serve as the National Field Director of Moms Clean Air Force. We're a community of over one million moms and dads united against air pollution and climate change for the sake of our children's health. I'm here today to explain why the EPA's proposed rule is completely unacceptable and should be withdrawn. In March of this year, one of our member moms, Nikki Catrice White, traveled with us to D.C. to participate in the EPA hearing on the MATS proposal. Nikki's a healthcare worker, a native of Camden, South Carolina, where she lives and raises her two children. And as a black mother living in the shadow of the local coal-fired power plant, Nikki is acutely aware of the need for strong air pollution controls. She sat before the EPA hearing panel and shared how her family was grateful for the sustainable income, yet at the same time blissfully unsuspecting of the dangers that come with living alongside coal-fired power plants. She shared how they didn't think twice when her mother gave birth to her only son and he was stillborn. They didn't give it a second thought when her mother and sister developed fibroids because everybody believes that they're common among African-American women. And it didn't even dawn on her when her own children started to have respiratory issues when there was no family history or significant risk factors. In her words, we didn't link any of that to the fact that my mother's job was powered by May Plant, a coal-fired power plant just off the Watery River. We lived by it and we were exposed to these chemicals. But what we do know is that MATS is one of the several pollution standards that have helped clean up the environment in my community. Ms. White's words were not just spoken on behalf of her and her two children, but on behalf of the millions of kids across this country that live under a cloud of air pollution and dangerous brain damaging toxins that inhibit their lives and the limit their potential. When the agency proposed in February of 2019 to change key elements of the mercury and air toxic standards, claiming that as a result of the extremely limiting accounting of the costs and benefits rules, the rule is not appropriate and necessary, our mothers found that disingenuous and dangerous. The criteria of appropriate and necessary is a legal yardstick under the Clean Air Act, and removing this status undermines the legal foundation of the rule, leaving it vulnerable to legal challenge. Furthermore, while EPA has continuously claimed that it's leaving the current standard for mercury emission in place, they're taking steps consistent with changing and or altering the rule altogether. Not only does the propose, proposal directly attack the underlying justification of MATS, but EPA specifically solicits comments on whether if it were to finalize its proposed conclusion, it then had the authority or the obligation to rescind the MATS rule altogether. This is an insult to the intelligence of mothers everywhere. I previously served as regional administrator for the EPA Southeast region under President Obama and EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy. My region covered eight states, six tribes, and over a quarter of the nation's population. My job was to not only assist communities and industry to implement MATS, but also to explain the importance of these protective measures, especially in vulnerable communities and communities of color. I also am a former mayor, having served my hometown of Greenville, Mississippi for two th terms, and I'm the mother of three, one of whom has joined me today. Mothers know that coal-burning power plants are the largest source of human-caused mercury emissions in the U.S., and mercury is harmful to the developing brain. In 2005, researchers estimated that between 316,000 and 637,000 newborns were born each year in the U.S. with elevated mercury levels in their blood, levels associated with the loss of IQ. 
The resulting loss of intelligence and lost productivity was calculated to cost $8.7 billion in 2000 dollars. Everything we know about these pollutants show that controlling them is not just appropriate, but vital. It's deeply problematic and a direct threat to our children's health that EPA now proposes to decide otherwise. Moms Clean Air Force, together with a diverse set of allies and partners, collected more than 350,000 comments in opposition to this proposal that was submitted to the docket. So what should be done? To the current rule, nothing. If they choose to do anything at all, EPA must strengthen our nation's limits on mercury and toxic pollution from coal-fired power plants. I shared earlier that I have three children and my greatest role is being a mother. My youngest son is two and a half, and when he plays with blocks, he likes to stack them into tall towers. He has sense enough to know that if you pull the bottom block out, the rest of the tower will fall. If at two and a half, he has the good common sense to understand that foundations matter. Why does this administration and agency not understand that pulling the base from a protective rule can make the rest of it crumble? Why they would ever consider weakening a rule that protects babies' brains is senseless, and this must be called out for what it is. It is a direct threat threat to our children's health, and we will not take these threats kindly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chair now recognizes Mr. Livermore for five minutes for an opening statement. Madam Chair, Ranking Member Guthrie, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My testimony will focus on the treatment of costs and benefits uh, in EPA's current proposal. The use of costs benefit analysis to, to evaluate environmental regulation has a long history in the United States and has been embraced by administrations of both political parties. Cost-benefit analysis creates a formal process for a simple idea. Agencies ought to do their best to anticipate and evaluate the consequences of their decisions and seek out rules that provide large benefits at low costs. Over time, approaches for counting costs and benefits have become standardized. Guidance, docu guidance documents, such as OMB's Circular A4, which was published during the George W. Bush administration, describe best practices for how agencies should do this. A value of these best practices is maintaining consistency between agency decisions. One major critique leveled against the practice of cost-benefit analysis is that it's vulnerable to manipulation by agencies that want to provide ad hoc rationalization for policy choices that are based on political expediency. Well-established best practices reduce this threat because they create a clear standard that can be used to hold agencies accountable. If an agency departs from established methods, that raises a red flag alerting the public and oversight officials to the possibility of manipulation. The larger the departure from established practices, the stronger the reason that the agency has to give for its departure. In EPA's current proposal, the agency does in fact depart from established methods of conducting cost-benefit analysis, raising that red flag that the agency is more interested in providing cover for a decision uh, than in truly understanding the consequences of its actions. EPA's earlier analysis of the MATS rule, which was undertaken under the Obama administration, projected $9.6 billion per year in compliance costs and between $37 billion and $90 billion per year in quantified benefits, in addition to substantial unquantified health and environmental benefits. Contradicting the relevant guidance and decades of practice by administrations of both political parties, the current proposal functionally ignores the largest class of benefits associated with the MATS rule, and this is life savings. Let's just be clear about what these benefits are. They're life savings for many thousand Americans. The result is a biased and misleading estimate that creates the false impression that the MATS rule were not justified in cost-benefit terms. The grounds that the EPA provides for functionally ignoring these benefits is that they are indirect co-benefits that result from exposure to particulate matter or a reduction in exposure to particulate matter. These particulate matter benefits occur as a result of the pollution control technologies that are used by firms to comply with the MATS rule. The A4 circular, which again was adopted during the Bush administration, and EPA's own peer-reviewed guidance on conducting cost-benefit analysis direct the agency to analyze both direct and indirect costs and benefits. Since President Reagan, EPA has counted co-benefits in many regulatory contexts, including many other clean air rules. 
the agency fails to provide any adequate reading for any adequate reason for this extraordinary and abnormal treatment of co-benefits. Nothing in either the relevant case law or the statute require the agency to functionally ignore tens of billions of dollars of regulatory benefits. If finalized and adopted, the proposal would not only undermine a socially desirable environmental policy, it would create a dangerous precedent of agencies departing from established methods when it is politically convenient to do so. Um, which would open the door in the future to flagrant manipulation of cost-benefit analysis. Such a trend would result in inefficient regulation, because we're no longer adequately doing the analysis, and would further erode public confidence in government. I'm ha happy to answer any follow-up questions that you may have. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Saleem, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Deget, Ranking Member Guthrie, for this opportunity to speak. I would like to share some of the latest developments in scientific understanding of where mercury comes from, how it travels in the environment, and how it ultimately affects human health. Mercury is emitted to the air by human activities, such as burning coal, a major source of mercury pollution. Once it's in the air, mercury undergoes chemical changes and can deposit both nearby and far away from sources, depending on its chemical form. After depositing to water bodies, mercury can be converted to methylmercury, which is a potent neurotoxin. This form of mercury accumulates up food chains, and people in the United States are exposed to methylmercury, primarily by eating fish and shellfish. Scientific knowledge about mercury has advanced significantly since the mercury and air toxic standards were developed. My own research has focused on understanding and quantifying the effects of reductions in mercury emissions. That requires understanding where mercury is emitted, where it travels, where it's deposited and in what quantities, and how that mercury could affect human health. One such analysis we did is particularly relevant to the math standard. In a paper published in early 2016 in the peer-reviewed journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, we quantified the direct mercury-related benefits to the US of domestic and international mercury reductions. We calculated the expected changes in exposure to methylmercury and quantified the expected impacts from the math standard compared to the impacts that would occur without the standard. Our best estimate is that the monetized mercury-related benefits of maths will amount to $3.7 billion per year. The original regulatory impact analysis EPA performed for the maths role in 2011 quantified only a subset of those benefits and valued that subset at approximately $4 to $6 million, a thousand times less. Our estimates are larger for two key reasons. First, we looked at the entire US population, while EPA considered only people who consume fish they catch for themselves in freshwater. Recent work has shown that more than 80% of methylmercury exposure to the US population comes from saltwater fish, most of which is from the commercial market. Second, we included both the impacts of mercury on reduced IQ in newborns, as well as cardiovascular impacts for all adults while EPA looks solely at the reduction of IQ. An EPA-convened expert panel concluded in 2011 that scientific evidence for mercury's cardiovascular effects was strong enough to include those effects in estimating benefits of regulations. Because of these two factors, our 2016 estimates are a more comprehensive assessment of the benefits of maths than EPA's in 2011. Yet the latest science indicates that even our work may be an underestimate for several reasons. First, we now know that mercury can have other health, health impacts in addition to those we assessed. Methylmercury can have neurobehavioral effects beyond IQ declines, as well as impacts on the immune system and reproductive system. These effects are harder to quantify in dollar terms, but scientific evidence that they're occurring continues to grow. Including these impacts would obviously increase the cost of mercury emissions and the benefits of reducing them. Second, our main estimates also do not take into account how long mercury lasts in the environment. Mercury is an element, so it doesn't go away. Mercury that we emit today circulates in the environment for decades and even centuries. This mercury can accumulate in the soil and below the surface in the ocean and return to the atmosphere. It then deposits again, converts to methylmercury, and affects the health of future fish consumers as well. We estimated that taking into account these impacts would make our estimates about 30% larger. Third, our aggregate numbers for the entire US population obscure the fact that the burdens of mercury pollution can fall disproportionately on some sensitive populations. These include those living near large emission sources, such as coal-fired power plants, 
and those for whom eating freshwater fish is important for subsistence, recreational, or cultural reasons, including Native Americans. Finally, our estimates only address the direct benefits of mercury reductions. The benefits of the role for reducing air pollution from particulate matter are substantial as well, and these were also quantified by EPA. For regulatory analysis to be accurate, it's important to take into account all potential consequences of regulations, intended or not, both positive and negative. In summary, the number of studies on mercury has been increasing dur during the nearly two decades I've been working on mercury science, and the best available science now indicates that the impacts of mercury are far larger than previously estimated. EPA needs to take into account the latest science on mercury as it makes its decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Chair is now pleased to recognize Dr. Landergan for uh, five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, Ranking Member Guthrie, for having invited me to testify before you. I come before you today as a pediatrician to talk about the impacts that mercury and particulate air pollution have on children, and when I say children, I mean unborn children in the womb, infants, and children as they're growing up uh, across the span of childhood. And in my mind, the strongest reason for having a strong match rule is to protect the health of children and then to protect the health of future generations. So why the focus on children? Children are exquisitely vulnerable to hazards in the environment. I chaired a committee at the National Academy of Sciences that uh, looked at this issue for five years from 1988 to 1993. And we identified a series of reasons why children are more vulnerable than adults to toxic chemicals in the environment. Firstly, children are more heavily exposed. Uh, they breathe four times as much air per day per pound of body weight as an adult, and therefore they will take much more proportionately of any foreign material into their body that's in the air. Secondly, they're biologically more vulnerable. A child's brain throughout the nine months of pregnancy and on across childhood is rapidly, the, the cells in the brain are dividing, multiplying, and migrating according to precisely defined sequences. By the time a child is born, there are approximately a billion cells in the brain with three billion precisely engineered connections between and among those cells. If any toxic chemical gets into the body of a child during those complex, tightly choreographed processes of early development, things can go badly wrong, any, especially any chemical that directly damages the nervous system. And this is the case for methylmercury. We've heard about methylmercury, major source of emissions from coal-fired power plants that go through the atmosphere, get into fish, and then people consume the fish. And if a pregnant mom consumes high levels of methylmercury during pregnancy, we know from tragic experience 50 years ago in Japan that the impacts can be devastating. In a place called Minamata, Japan, there was an epidemic of terrible neurological disease in newborn infants in which babies were born with small heads, blind, deaf, profoundly retarded, and spastic. Just as research on lead has shown us that gross, obvious, clinically detectable poisoning is only the tip of the iceberg, so too for mercury. We now know that even down to the lowest levels of mercury that are measurable, that mercury can damage the developing brain of an unborn child, an infant, and a child to produce a whole range of abnormal effects. We've heard about reduced IQ, also shortened attention span, also behavioral problems. There's two points I really want to emphasize in regard to the neurological damage that mercury causes to children. Number one, this damage occurs down to the lowest measurable levels. There is no safe threshold. Standards that regulate the level of mercury in air are important, but there are no guarantee of safety. Damage occurs at levels of exposure below, below those, uh, below those uh, artificial standards. And the second important point is that this damage is permanent, it's irreversible, it's not treatable by any known medical treatment, and therefore the only rational approach to dealing with it is, is to prevent it. With that as background, I urge you to take the steps that are necessary to protect the underpinnings, the legal underpinnings of the MATS rule um, to protect our children today and future generations. <clears throat> the, uh, the MATS rule has been a tremendous success. It's reduced levels of mercury in the environment by more than 85 percent, which means that uh, a generation of children born in the past 10 or 15 years is being exposed to much lower levels of mercury than their predecessors. The situation here is very analogous to what happened back in the 1970s 
when EPA took lead out of gasoline. At that time, we were putting 100,000 tons of lead into gasoline each year in this country. The average blood level in our children was close to 20 micrograms. In starting in 1975, EPA directed that lead be taken out of gasoline in a phased process. Over the next decade, blood lead levels in American children declined by more than 90 percent. Acute lead poisoning virtually has gone away in this country. Every child born since 1980 has five more IQ points than children born before that time because of the reduction in lead. I recall that back in 1982, then EPA Administrator Ann Gorsuch tried to put lead back into gasoline. Uh, Congress rebuffed her and the lives of American children were saved, their health and their brains were preserved into the future. Are you sure to do the same today? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair's now pleased to recognize uh, Mr. Gustafson for five minutes. Thank you, Chair DeGette, for inviting me to speak about uh, EPA's proposed reconsideration of the Mercury Rule Supplemental Finding. Please move your microphone closer as well. Thank you. Pardon me. EPA's proposal represents an important course correction in the agency's accounting of the costs and benefits of environmental regulation. EPA is correct that it should not give equal weight to incidental reductions of pollutants like particulate matter that could not legally be regulated under the same statutory regime as mercury. The 2012 mercury rule was one in a series of expensive rules that EPA cost justified on the basis of co-benefits from incidental reductions of PM, even though PM is not the object of those regulations and is already regulated under different provisions of the Clean Air Act that govern criteria pollutants. Out of 37 to $90 billion in projected annual benefits, more than 99% came from the Mercury Rule's projected PM effects. PM reductions are the gift that regulators keep regifting. In the last administration, most of the benefits of federal regulation came from PM-related co-benefits. In Michigan v. EPA, the Supreme Court agreed with the rule's challengers that EPA had to consider costs in determining whether the rule was appropriate. The Supreme Court did not decide whether EPA could rely on co-benefits, but that question was lurking in the background. At oral argument, Chief Justice Roberts noted, quote, it's a good thing if your regulation also benefits in other ways, but when it's such a disproportion, you begin to wonder whether it's an illegitimate way of avoiding the quite different limitations on EPA that apply in the criteria program, end quote. EPA is now in litigation over the Obama administration's supplemental finding, which relies on PM co-benefits to justify the Mercury Rule. When the Trump administration took office, EPA had to decide whether to defend that finding or redo it. Today, I want to explain why EPA's proposed revision is required by statute and also why it is necessary to rationalize EPA's cost-benefit analysis. First, the Obama EPA's use of PM co-benefits to justify the mercury rule violates an express prohibition on regulating PM and other criteria pollutants under Section 112, the statute that governs mercury and other hazardous air pollutants, or HAPS. If you want to know what pollutants really motivated the mercury rule, consider that 95 percent of its PM co-benefits but none of the direct benefits came from controls on acid gas emissions. By justifying a HAP rule on the basis of PM co-benefits, the agency <coughs> sidestepped the prohibition on regulating PM under Section 112. This is not just a technicality. Congress intended criteria pollutants to be regulated under an entirely different framework that puts states, not EPA, in the driver's seat. After EPA sets a national ambient air quality standard, it's the states that get to decide how to implement it. By using PM co-benefits to justify the rule, the Obama EPA substituted its judgment for the state's judgment about the best way to regulate PM. Even if the Clean Air Act had nothing to say about it, EPA's new proposal would be necessary to correct its arbitrary accounting of PM co-benefits. EPA's air quality standard already requires states to reduce PM concentrations to the level that EPA deems, quote, requisite to protect the public health with an adequate margin of safety. Yet the Obama EPA counted PM co-benefits both above and below the levels of the PM standard. 
The benefits of attaining the PM standard were accounted for when EPA set that standard in the first place. Treating those reductions as co-benefits of the MATS rule amounts to double counting. Belts and suspenders each keep one's pants up, but wearing both at the same time does not yield twice the benefit. As for incidental PM reductions in areas that have already attained the PM standard, the Obama EPA unreasonably treated them as equally beneficial to reductions above the standard. That makes no sense. Less than a year after the mercury rule, EPA set a PM standard of 12 micrograms because that level was somewhat below the concentration shown by certain key studies to cause adverse health effects. Reducing PM below that level cannot possibly yield the same degree of health benefits as reductions in non-compliant areas. In conclusion, EPA's proposed reconsideration of the mercury rule's cost-benefit analysis is necessary to give effect to the Supreme Court's instruction in Michigan v. EPA and to the cooperative federalism framework that Congress established in the Clean Air Act. Following this approach and future rulemakings would avoid reporting illusory or duplicative benefits and would help to rationalize EPA's air quality regulation. I welcome your questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Gustafson. The chair now recognizes herself for five minutes for questioning. Uh, Ms. McCabe, the MATS rule is the first time the EPA has successfully protected the public from mercury release from power plants. And at Congress's direction, the EPA studied this issue in the 1990s, and then it took steps to develop the mercury standards for power plants as far back as 2000. Is that correct? Yes. And Ms. McTeer Tony, I understand that the EPA's current mercury and air toxic standards, which were finalized in 2012, now provide critical public health protections for fence line communities near power plants, which are often low wealth communities. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. And I, you know, I will say, I, we ha I was just telling Mr. Guthrie, we have one of these communities right in my congressional district, Swansea, O'Leary, and Globeville, where we actually had to go in and remove mercury from the yards of the homes there. Um, Dr. Landrigan, I uh, want to ask you, we know that mercury emissions can carry enorm enormous public health consequences. You talked about um, children and pregnant women, um, and I think that what you said is, that these babies that are born after being exposed can suffer IQ and motor skills that impairments that will, will really last a lifetime. They don't go away. Is that right? That is correct, ma'am. And um, back to you, Ms. McCabe. As, as of today, the industry has actually spent billions of dollars to come into compliance with these rules. And in fact, at the power industry, what we heard is that, that they support keeping the rule in place. Is that also correct? Yeah, that's my understanding. Okay. Dr. Celine, um, uh, recent study, uh, th thank you for your excellent analysis. I thought it was terrific. And recent studies have suggested the direct benefits of protecting against mercury but it may be actually be much higher than the ones quantified by the EPA. And in fact, you found that the direct monetized benefits of mercury protection might be 3.7 billion more per year. And I think you said that's, that's many more times than the EPA found in 2011. Is that right? That's correct. Um, and and uh, that's the direct benefits. Yes. Okay. Now, Mr. Livermore, um, you said in your testimony that the Obama EPA's finding was extremely well justified in cost-benefit terms. And is that right? Absolutely. And you also said regarding the Trump EPA's proposal and methodology, it's, quote, contradicting the relevant guidance and decades of practice by both political parties and results in, quote, a biased and misleading estimate of cost and benefit. Could you please elaborate on that? Well, you know, the, the purpose of cost-benefit analysis is to understand the consequences of an agency decision. And by excluding a large category of consequences, it's just functionally inconsistent with that goal. One, it's just kind of turning a blind eye to a enormous category of consequences. Here we're talking about thousands of lives being saved that have quantified benefits of you know, many billions of dollars, tens of billions of dollars. So if the goal of cost-benefit analysis is to get a clear picture of what the consequences of a decision are, blocking off a big chunk of the picture is just not how you do that. Okay. Um, now, now um, Ms. McTeer-Tony, 
can you, um, uh, you, you, you really uh, talked about the EPA and how they're the ones to blame for this. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? So the fact that the EPA is reconsidering or weakening this proposal is unnecessary. They use the term appropriate and, and unnecessary in terms of challenging the Michigan decision when the reality is there's no need for them to do so. The decision was currently in the hands of the court and the, the Obama administration did respond, but it was the Trump administration's EPA that decided to put that into abeyance and not defend it. And so as a result, there's a decision that's being made that's completely and totally unnecessary. The second part of that is that they are taking actions right now that would weaken the rule. They say they're not trying to do it, but at the same time, they're holding hearings, they're requesting comments, and doing things that, in the scope of practice at EPA, one would do if you're going to actually reconsider or move and change. So if their intent was actually to strengthen the rule, what would they do instead of what they're doing now? They would have allowed it to proceed to the court system. Uh, I believe the Obama-era uh, Obama um, supplement middle decision would have been upheld. We don't know that because the court hasn't made that decision. And then they would have looked into the communities and looked and working in states to determine what things they need to do to make the, the rules stronger. Thank you very much. I, I thank all of the witnesses. And I now would like to recognize the ranking member for five minutes for purposes of question. Thank you very much. And I thank all the witnesses uh, for being here. And Mr. Gustafson, I want to ask you a couple of questions focused on the way that Congress constructed the Clean Air Act. And uh, obviously, Congress has the ability to change it if, if need be. And so it's my understanding that the Clean Air Act is designed to regulate hazardous air pollutants, such as mercury, and criteria pollutants, such as particulate matter, under different sections of the Clean Air Act. In your testimony, you state the Obama administration's 2016 supplemental fact-finding, which EPA is now reconsidering, violates Section 112's prohibition on regulating criteria pollutants and it violates the statute's instruction to determine appropriateness of HAP regulation for coal fire plants only after imposition of the requirements of this chapter. Can you explain what you mean by this? And so explain what you mean by this. And based on your understanding of the Clean Air Act, what section of the act would be more appropriate section to regulate criteria pollutants? Thank you, Ranking Member Guthrie. Yes, that's exactly right. Uh, the Clean Air Act does address all of the pollutants that have been discussed today, but they, the, the Act does so under different pr provisions. Particulate matter is one of the criteria pollutants uh, that is regulated under Sections 108, 109, and 110 of the Clean Air Act. EPA sets the, identifies the criteria pollutants under 108. They set a standard under 109. And the states implement that standard with state implementation plans under Section 110. That is why uh, under Section 112, which governs mercury and other hazardous air pollutants, EPA is not permitted to regulate criteria pollutants like, uh, like particulate matter. In addition, as you mentioned, uh, Section 112 also requires EPA, before regulating hazardous air pollutants from coal-fired power plants to first determine whether, in light of all of the other Clean Air Act regulation governing those sources, uh, further regulation is appropriate and necessary. So the uh, EPA is already required to accept as a baseline the existence of other regulation, including the, the other regulation of PM, including the National Ambient Air Quality Standard. Um, and the problem with the, the mercury rule adopted under the past administration was that it treated co-benefits, that is reductions of uh, particulate matter, as equivalent to reductions of pollutants that the agency is allowed to regulate under Section 112. So uh, the question isn't that these don't need to be regulated. The question is how they're regulated in accordance with the way Congress instructed the EPA. So Congress could change that instruction if we so. That's exactly move right. And indeed, if, if the standard is not stringent enough, then EPA could set a new particulate matter standard. They did that last in 2013, not a year after the Mercury Rule was promulgated. Okay, thanks. And your testimony further states that because the states are principally responsible for implementing the EPA's treatment of PM reductions as co, as co benefits of its HAP regulation, violates the cooperative federal and federalism framework. So you talked about the federalism framework. Can you elaborate on how this violates the cooperative federalism framework that was intended by Congress? Certainly. 
So under uh, Section 110 of the Clean Air Act, states uh, get to implement the, the standards for criteria pollutants like particulate matter. That means that they develop, the states develop an <coughs> implementation plan. They get to decide what they think is the best way of addressing those pollutants given the circumstances on the ground within those states. Um, and by the way, uh, criteria pollutants like particulate matter come from a variety of sources. It's not only power plants that produce these pollutants. So states have at, at a menu of options for reducing particulate matter. They can do that by, by uh, imposing limits on power plants, but they can also do that uh, by regulating other sources, including motor vehicles that uh, produce PM. So basically, the, by treating co-benefits as the justification for this rule, uh, the Obama administration uh, usurped the state's prerogative to decide the best way to regulate criteria. So I have a question. So if, so if co-benefits are the, the major reason for this rule movement, cost-benefit analysis, I think 99 percent, um, so does this mean that utilities that are located in an area that is already in attainment, again, that there is that is to mean the EPA's deemed safe standard is being forced to achieve levels that are are they are the utilities in safe attained areas being forced to achieve levels below the standard? Yes, that's correct. the The 2016 supplemental finding makes clear that the agency is defending uh, claimed PM co benefits both above and below the na national ambient air quality standard. Thank you. Uh, my time's expired. But I do have some. Uh, to, for the record, uh, offers. I, I submitted a list. I can read the list or can so I read the seven? So the seven items that I submitted the list to the chair would be accepted in the um, Yes, I, I just would point out four of the five articles um, on your list, uh, on the ranking members list, were written by the same person, Ann Smith. And I understand that she's a consultant for industry, but I will admit the, all, of the, all of the items on the list without objection. Okay, thank you. Chair is now pleased to recognize the Vice Chair of the Oversight Subcommittee, Mr. Kennedy, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and apologies for being a little late at coming back. According to the EPA's website, quote, the mission of the EPA is to protect the human health and the environment, end quote. That seems pretty straightforward, and yet here we are. EPA's enforcement is declining, uh, as we saw a few months ago when the subcommittee and the EPA is failing to protect human health and the environment. Yet, here we see EPA wasting enormous resources and energy in their effort to question whether it is appropriate and necessary to regulate mercury. Ms. McTeeter, Tony, you said in your testimony that uh, you, uh, as you take EPA to task for this uh, division of, or diversion of resources, and you write, uh, quote, rather than revisiting these life-saving standards, EPA should be strengthening them to reduce hazardous air pollutants further from these sources to better protect the health of children, families, and communities living near the facilities and downwind from them. So, ma'am, do you consider EPA's current mercury proposal consistent with its mission statement, again, to protect human health and the environment? Uh, yes, I do, but may I elaborate just a bit? Please. I think it's important also to note that how this works together uh, is something that additionally helps communities to realize these benefits. It was mentioned before that the uh, states have the opportunity to regulate through their own SIPs, but they work together interchangeably. So the way that the states realize these benefits that help these communities is they are dependent upon the standards that are set by the federal government. That's how they make their decisions. When we weaken and change those standards, it then weakens the state's abilities to make those decisions through their step through their SIP programs, which in turn cost the state money, which in turn cost the people their health benefits. So it all works together, and that's why it's so important for us to realize and why moms are so concerned is because we know this will hit us in our communities quicker than anywhere else. And so, Ms. McCabe, if EPA really wanted to protect human health and the environment, in particular with regard to mercury and air uh, toxics, what, would actions, uh, what actions should the agency be taking now? Well, they wouldn't go forward with this proposal, that's for sure. Um, they would look at other rules that, uh, and other sources that are uh, emitting <coughs> pollution, whether it's toxic pollution or other pollution in our communities, um, and work to strengthen those rules. Um, it would help the states um, rather than what, what they're doing now is pushing the responsibility onto the states and yet mm -hmm. taking away the very programs that will help states meet their standards, like MATS, like the Clean Car Program, 
States cannot regulate motor vehicles. The uh, Clean Air Act requires that EPA do that. So um, it's, it's, they're, they're saying that they're helping the states, but they're really not. And so building off that, EPA seems to want to have it both ways, just as you indicated. So it wants to tell the public that they're trying to keep uh, Mercury Rule in its place, but at the same time taking actions that would seem to undermine the very rule's foundation. Um, true? True. So EPA's attempt to undermine important toxic pollutant protections, unfortunately, as I, th I think you would indicate, is not new. Back in the 1980s, there was an attempt by the EPA that was thankfully unsuccessful to roll back standards relating to keeping lead out of gasoline. Uh, Dr. Landrigan, can you tell us more about the previous effort and what that teaches us about how we need to respond today with regards to the mercury protections? Well, the, um, the effort to take lead out of gasoline began in the early 1970s when pediatricians and various studies recognized that lead could cause damage to the brains of children at levels that were well below standards, that were well below the levels that were then considered to be safe. And in fact, the cycle has repeated itself several times since. As more and more sophisticated research has come along, we found harm at levels of exposure lower and lower and lower until today the official statement of the Centers for Disease Control on lead and mercury is that no level of exposure is safe. So acting on that information, EPA mandated that lead be taken out of gasoline beginning in 1975. And as I mentioned in my testimony, that led to a 90% reduction in blood lead levels in American children, a five-point gain in the IQ of every child born since 1980, and an estimated economic benefit uh, to this country of $200 billion in each annual class of children born since 1980, which is an aggregate benefit of close to um, uh, eight trillion, if my math is correct. Um, in 1982, uh, in the Reagan administration, uh, then EPA Administrator Ann Gorsuch made a brief, ultimately unsuccessful attempt to put lead back into gasoline, reportedly acting at the request of a, a single refinery in New Mexico. But that was beaten back, and American children today enjoy blood lead levels less than two micrograms, as opposed to the levels of close to 20 micrograms, which were the case 30 years ago. Thank you, sir. I yield back. Chair now recognizes Mr. Walden for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And again, thanks to the witnesses. We, as you can tell, we've got a couple hearings going on simultaneously, so we have to bounce back and forth. Mr. Gustafson, um, in your testimony, you discuss concerns that both Chief Justice John Roberts and now Justice Kavanaugh raised regarding the heavy reliance on co-benefits to justify the Matt's rule. Now, if a court is asked to decide whether such heavy reliance can be given to co-benefits to justify the Mercury rule, what do you think is the likely outcome? Thank you for the question. I think there's a... Um, high likelihood that other justices on the Supreme Court would share the skepticism uh, that Chief Justice Roberts expressed in oral argument in the Michigan case about EPA's undue reliance on uh, really disproportionate uh, co PM co-benefits to justify the Mercury Rule. So I, I think courts should be skepticism, skeptical of that uh, methodology. So in, in your testimony, you, you laid out how the reliance in the 2016 supplemental finding on co-benefits involves three distinct statutory defects. As one of the defects, you note that Section 112 of the Clean Air Act expressly prohibits the EPA from adding an air pollutant which is listed under Section 108, such as particulate matter, to the Section 112 list. Now, if the EPA tried to directly regulate particulate matter under Section 112, what do you think would be the likely outcome? Uh, that, that action would be clearly unlawful and uh, would be uh, rejected by a court. All right, thank you. Um, Ms. McCabe, uh, in Michigan versus EPA, the Supreme Court ruled that the agency must consider cost when determining whether or not it's appropriate and necessary to regulate power plants for hazardous air pollutants. The day after this ruling, June 30th, 2015, the EPA issued a blog post saying, and I quote, from the moment we learned of this decision, we were committed to ensuring that standards remain in place to protect the public from toxic emissions from coal and oil-fired electric utilities, close quote. Now, given this statement, what did the EPA believe was the purpose of the Supreme Court's decision in ruling that the EPA must consider cost when making the appropriate and necessary termination? 
Yeah, so to clarify, the EPA did consider cost in the rulemaking. We did it in conjunction with the rule itself, not with the appropriate and necessary finding. And uh, we had a um, reasonable belief to think that that was not required. The Supreme, the D.C. Circuit agreed. The Supreme Court disagreed, um, told us to use appropriate methods, left it to the EPA's discretion on how to do that cost analysis. So we were, uh, we were confident because the, the cost and benefit analysis had already been done. Uh, that the rule was well justified um, and, um, and ought to remain in place and we're committed to moving forward to respond to the court's direction right. to do that analysis in the context of the appropriate and necessary findings. So in your written statement today, you state that, and I quote, another significant flaw in EPA's approach is the fact that it is basing its revised analysis on a record that's demonstrably out of date, close quote. Mm -hmm. Yet in the 2016 supplemental finding, EPA responded to the commenters asking for updated cost estimates by stating that it was not, and I quote, consistent with the statute, close quote, for the EPA to try to estimate the actual costs incurred through compliance with the final CAA Section 112D standards, close quote. If it was not consistent with the statute to use an updated cost estimate in 2016, why do you criticize the AP, EPA's use of the original numbers today? Well, these are very different circumstances. EPA was responding to a direct um, direction from the Supreme Court in that particular rulemaking. Um, what the EPA do, is doing now is initiating uh, sua sponte on its own uh, initiative um, an inquiry and a change of approach. Um, right. And in the meantime, a lot has happened in the world. The, 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 we, we, it is now, um, uh, it can be determined how much the rule actually cost and right. is expected to cost. And as we've heard today, there's a lot more information and study about the, the benefits so, of mercury reduction. Thank you. If the blog post I referenced earlier in my questioning, the one that was issued the day after the Supreme Court ruled in Michigan v. EPA, the EPA stated the majority of the power plants are all ready in compliance or well on their way to compliance. Given that this statement was made a year before the 2016 supplemental finding, didn't the agency have updated cost information at that time too? Well, uh, no, we didn't. Um, you did uh, not. We, di we did not. We did take comment on a proposed supplemental finding um, and looked at that information and actually made some adjustments in the final supplemental finding in response to that information. All right, my time's expired. Thank you, Ben. Thank you so much. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Tonko, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Deget and uh, Ranker Guthrie for um, holding this hearing. I thank you for the partnership that you've had with the Environment Subcommittee. And together, I believe we've been able to conduct oversight of EPA's efforts to undermine MATS and rollback of other Clean Air Act protections, which I think is a very important uh, mission for us to pursue. Uh, Mr. Livermore, the um, Trump EPA's current proposal is that it is no longer appropriate and necessary to regulate mercury, while at the same time EPA is trying to convince the public that it is keeping the mercury rule in place. So um, was the Obama EPA using cost-benefit methodology correctly by counting the roughly $90 billion in co-benefits that came along with regulating mercury? Yes, absolutely. It was correct as a matter of kind of economics and policy and also of uh, all guidance that's relevant to the question. And now it seems that the Trump administration, by finding that it is no longer appropriate and necessary to regulate mercury, considers only the roughly $6 million figure in benefits from mercury reductions, not the roughly $90 million, a billion, excuse me, in co-benefits that came from reducing particulate matter. Mr. Livermore, you disagree with this approach and say that it results in, and I quote, a biased and misleading estimate of costs and benefits. However it, seems, however, it seems that EPA is suggesting that they are legally required to take their, uh, their current approach. So do you believe the Trump EPA is legally required to exclude co-benefits in looking at the uh, Mercury rule? Absolutely not. Uh, there are... Uh, again, decades of practice under various statutory provisions, some of which look very similar to uh, the one in question of agencies accounting for indirect benefits, including uh, administrations, uh, the, the Reagan and Bush rulemakings under the Reagan and Bush administrations. Uh, the, again, there's decades of practice. If Congress had wanted to um, make a change to make it clear that uh, indirect benefits shouldn't be counted, I had plenty of time to do that. No point was that done. Uh, Michigan v. EPA, if anything, stands for the proposition that agencies should be looking more expansively at costs and benefits and not less so. And in 
fact, the, uh, you state in your testimony that in light of years of agency practice, agencies should consider indirect costs and benefits uh, when making regulatory decisions. And that, again, quote, departing from this well-established uh, norm requires a very good reason. So did the Trump EPA provide, um, quote, a very good reason for functionally dismissing co-benefits here uh, from the calculation? No, the, the reason it was a make-weight reason at best. Um, it doesn't distinguish other contexts where it counted indirect benefits. It doesn't limit the, uh, uh, the, the decision to this particular context. It's not clear when it's going to be applied in other contexts. And so the decision-making, uh, the reason provided by the agency was, uh, was, was very weak. And you say that if the current EPA Mercury proposal is finalized and adopted, it would be, and I quote, opening the door to the flagrant manipulation of cost-benefit analysis. Uh, Mr. Livermore, can you elaborate on the risks of the Trump administration's new approach to future rulemaking? Yes. <clears throat> so, uh, so indirect benefits can be an important class of benefits. And so if the decision in this case were applied across the board, it would just lead to gross inefficiencies in our environmental protection system. Um, I, almost more dangerously is that the agency could kind of pick and choose, or any agency for that matter, when it wanted to look at indirect benefits or not, or which indirect benefits it wanted to look, look at, or indirect costs for that matter. Um, and if that's the case, then the entire purpose of cost-benefit analysis goes out the window um, because agencies should, can just provide uh, post hoc rationalizations for decisions that are arrived on political grounds. Well, I thank you for your answers. The Trump EPA's misguided approach ignores billions of dollars in benefits that come from avoided premature deaths, heart attacks, asthma attacks, and more. Um, revising the uh, cost-benefit calculation is not uh, simply an academic exercise. What we have here are people's lives and, and health uh, being at stake. Um, and is it... Um, is it double counting to consider outside benefits? Uh, no, there, there's various claims about double counting um, that none of, them, none of them stand up. A question that has come up is counting benefits below the NACs. Um, so the National Ambient Air Quality Standards set are set across the country. They're set according to a cost blind standard. They are not set, and EPA has never said that they are set at a zero risk standard. Um, and so the idea that there are no benefits below the NACs is just uh, uh, non-scientific, and it's not it's ne the agency has never said it. Um, and so it's entirely appropriate for the agency to count those benefits. Uh, so so, so the, the short answer is no, there's no double counting in this rule. And the, actually, the agency is very fastidious about avoiding double counting, um, and, so, uh, and, and it hasn't done so in this case. Well, I very much appreciate uh, your answers. Uh, and uh, again, this is about uh, protecting the people's health and uh, our environment. So with that, uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I th uh, make sure that we understand. I don't think there's a person on this panel uh, uh, here on the uh, in Congress uh, that wants to see the mercury levels uh, increase or cause problems. I think what we're trying to do is what's the best way to reduce our exposure. And from what I can understand, uh, using some of the information from the EPA, uh, primarily we're getting our exposure to mercury by eating fish and shellfish. Uh, water is not necessarily a source of that because we can capture that and, and uh, through the testing in our, in our municipal water systems, we'll test for that. So I'm interested if it's the fish, if, if it's the ingestion of fish that we're getting, uh, uh, I did some study on this. Uh, we saw on the Atlantic coast, the Atlantic tuna, uh, the, actually the, the uh, content or the, the, the exposure there to, to mercury is, do is dropped precipitously. But yet on the west coast, the, the mercury levels in the Pacific fish are increasing dramatically. So we see something that's kind of interesting. Maybe it's maybe it's a relate it's re relative to the fact that we've reduced by 86 percent the amount of um, mercury that we're emitting from our coal-fired power plants because we understand the wooden patterns how that works. And I think from your Dr. Salih, your some of your testimony talked about it. Can, once it gets in the atmosphere, it can stay for thousands of miles, and it may be coming. We have 
uh, coming from the Pacific Rim. We have a chart that unfortunately I can't, it's not, I can't blow it up anymore, but it simply shows that the, the big culprits in providing uh, the mercury emissions into the, into the atmosphere and primarily emitting into the water are coming from China and India. And we have a, a marked decrease. As a matter of fact, uh, in one of the other reports we have here that was in 2016, uh, says from the EPA that 83%, 83% of the mercury that's contaminating in the United States is coming from foreign sources. 83%. So if we're really focusing here, not politics, as we see some people chatting here, if we're really talking about how we're going to reduce our mercury levels in this country, I think we need to take into a, a global perspective of what we're going to do about this. Because these other nations are continuing to, uh, to emit mercury levels at very high levels. But I want to go back, so <clears throat> I want to go back to this cost-benefit ratio. So if that premise is correct, and I, I'm, I'm not going to get caught up in whether or not the, the uh, whether it's appropriate and necessary and, and whether co-benefits. I think what, one of the things we should do, and maybe Gustafsson, for you to respond would be, should in cost benefits, assuming even with the co-benefits, should we be considering the cost that would be incurred in foreign nations to reduce their mercury emissions? And right now, it's my understanding, the costs are only to American power plants that would be imposed, but the benefits will be derived by all. So since 83% is coming from someplace else, are we taking into consideration the costs that would be incurred in foreign nations to reduce so that we have that cost benefit, a true cost benefit ratio? Mr. Gustafson? You're, you're, exactly, you're exactly right that um, much of the mercury uh, deposited in the United States comes from other countries, including China, then there's nothing that the Environmental Protection Agency can do to control uh, pollution from China that limits the effectiveness of any mercury control uh, w within the United States. Uh, I would point out, though, that uh, the premise of much of my fellow panelists' uh, comments is that this mercury standard would go away if EPA were to finalize this proposed uh, uh, reconsideration of the fact-finding. That's not true. Under binding precedent in the D.C. Circuit, a case called New Jersey v. EPA, EPA would have to go through a delisting process uh, in order to withdraw uh, th these sources from the mercury uh, control. That's not uh, likely to happen. So I don't think uh, the risks that have been talked about here today are really uh, relevant. So just in closing, guys, just a second. Do you think that we should include the costs incurred by other nations? Would it be fair to include in the cost-benefit ratio, or should it just be the costs here in America, but the benefits from all sources, including PMs? Uh, that's a complicated question, and I'm not sure I'm prepared to give you an adequate response to it right now. I could follow up in, in written comments, but I, I think the EPA's primary responsibility is to address the nation's air quality. That's what the Clean Air Act gives, gives it jurisdiction for. Um, and it's limited in its ability to do that by pollution from- Ge Gentlemen's time's expired. Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from New Hampshire, Ms. Custer. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you to all of you for being with us. And I apologize that many of us have a hearing going on at the exact same time on prescription drug pricing. So I just want to focus in with um, Ms. McCabe about the current rules cost-benefit assessment. Does it account for all of the known human health effects of mercury? And in particular, it's my understanding that since the rule was signed, there have been a whole series of papers published about health effects uh, since the risk assessment upon which the rule is based was done back in 2010, and much of these health effects were not known at that time. So could you bring us up to date on that? Sure, yeah. When EPA does a cost-benefit analysis, as it does for any major rule, it uses the best information that it has available, and we have a notice and comment process that allows everybody to bring to the agency all the information that they have. And, and then 
uh, the agency makes the best decision looking at the full range of health benefits and recognizing that some of them we can monetize. We have studies that have helped us put a dollar figure on uh, different health effects, but we also know there are many health effects that we cannot mon monetize. Uh, the work has not been done, or it's just extremely difficult to do that. And, are you and aware of any new papers in the last decade that might shed light on this? For sure, and we've heard about some of them today. So th every minute, people are doing work on this and there is more information coming forward. So right now, today, we have better information about the costs of reducing mercury, the, the cost saved to, to human health, than we did in 2010. Absolutely. And was some of that information included, my understanding is there are close to 500,000 comments. Recently, is some of that included in that that we could review? I, I, I believe so, that, that people who have been commenting on this proposal have brought forward all this information. This new data. Mm -hmm. And do the current rules uh, cost-benefit assessment account for the full extent of the U.S. population exposed to mercury through fish consumption? Specifically, it's my understanding it was a relatively narrow assessment of freshwater fish, but not any assessment of saltwater fish consumption? Yes, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, we felt at the time that, that the information we had where we could uh, attach a dollar figure was limited to certain kinds of people who consume fish caught nearby in their communities, and that's what we monetized. Um, and since then, there has been research um, to, to um, uh, assign, uh, you know, explain the benefits on a much wider uh, perspective, in fact, the population across the country. Um, Madam Chair, I'd like to ask the committee staff if we could follow up and get that into the record on additional information. Um, and continuing uh, this line of questioning, I'll go to Mr. Uh, Livermore? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, it's my understanding that OMB has instructed agencies to consider co-benefits in rulemaking and that co-benefits have been used in the development of regulations for decades. Do you believe it was appropriate and legally justified for the Obama EPA to consider co-benefits in deciding to regulate mercury and other air toxics emissions? And if you could comment, did the EPA engage in double counting by counting reductions in particulate matter, which is regulated under a different provision of the Clean Air Act? So it was uh, absolutely appropriate for the agency to consider co-benefits. It was consistent with, uh, with the relevant guidance, with EPA's own peer-reviewed guidance, with OMB guidance, which was published during the George W. Bush administration. Um, and decades of practice of uh, administrations of both political parties. So it was very uh, uh, consistent with all of that and, and normal practice uh, uh, to consider co-benefits. Um, just to note, it's not like the agency, co-benefits just mean that when the agency regulates something that it's targeted at, there is a kind of a necessary and automatic other benefit that occurs. It's not the agency's, you know, it, it has no choice, essentially, but to generate yeah. these benefits. Right. Um, and then uh, uh, your second question was whether the agency engaged in double counting, and the answer is just no. Uh, what double counting means is like when you, uh, when you, when you get a benefit of some, out of some rulemaking, and, and then you also count it for some other rulemaking, something like that. There's actually lots of different ways that double counting could, uh, could emerge. The agency has guidance documents about how to avoid double counting, actually. And the, in, what the, in the match rulemaking, every decision the agency made was entirely consistent with its guidance to avoid double counting. Thank you very much, and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Clark, for five minutes. I thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I thank our panel of experts for appearing before us today. I wanted to clear something up that, in response to Mr. McKinley's line of questioning. Dr. Celine, can you please explain the distribution of mercury for us? Isn't it true that mercury emissions are distributed both regionally and globally? Yes, that's absolutely correct. Uh, mercury in the United States comes from both domestic and international sources. And the deposition of mercury to the United States um, is impacted by both of those sources. We've actually done some research that is directly relevant uh, to the previous question, looking at the benefits of domestic versus international controls on mercury. Um, and we found that per every ton of mercury emissions, the benefits to the US are an order of magnitude higher um, 
from the MAT standard than from international emissions. That really underlines the importance of mercury reductions, uh, not only for domestic benefits in the U.S., but also for regions in the U.S. that are particularly affected. Very well. I thank you for that clarification. EPA is claiming that its proposal responds to a 2015 Supreme Court decision, Michigan v. EPA, that requires the agency to consider costs before deciding whether to regulate mercury and air toxins from power plants. But EPA already responded to the Supreme Court ruling in 2016 when it issued its supplemental finding. And now the mercury standards that took so long to put in place have been fully implemented. Mercury and toxic air emissions are down substantially and the American people are reaping the benefits. So I wanna put all of this in, in perspective and ask Ms. McCabe, is there any court ruling that requires EPA to reopen the appropriate and necessary finding at this time? There is not, they are doing this totally on their own. Mm. A EPA asserts that its action to reopen the finding and compare only the so-called direct benefits of the rule to cost is quote, reasonable, and may be the only permissible approach, end quote, here. Uh, Mr. Livermore, as someone who understands cost-benefit analysis and its interaction with the Clean Air Act, do you agree that the EPA's hands are tied here, as it claims? A absolutely not. In fact, in Michigan v. EPA, the court explicitly said that it was not ruling on the question of co-benefits. If you've noted, a couple of folks have mentioned uh, Justice Roberts' discussion and oral argument. If you're grasping for comments during oral argument, that's not the law. Mm -hmm. The law is what's in the case. The case explicitly does not uh, address this question. And in your testimony, you state that the EPA's proposal provides no adequate explanation for its extraordinary and abnormal treatment of co-benefits. Can you explain why you believe EPA's new approach is such a departure from the norm? Yeah, absolutely. So again, in OMB guidance that had been around for decades that were adopted by the George W. Bush administration, the eight, not just EPA, but every agency is instructed to account for both direct and direct, indirect uh, costs and benefits. Uh, the agency has its own peer-reviewed guidance on this question where it states that indirect benefits should be counted, indirect costs and benefits, and decades of practice from administrations of both political parties. Very well. And Ms. McCabe, I'm worried it is the administration that is making standards legally vulnerable. EPA seems to acknowledge this by taking comments on whether to move the MAT standards altogether. Ms. McCabe, does this suggest to you that the EPA understands that it is leaving this standard legally vulnerable if it goes forward with this proposal? I think they do understand that. And there's been a lot of discussion today about why on earth are they doing this if they really mean it, that they don't mean to undo the standards. Mm -hmm. um, if they want to change a policy about um, cost-benefit analysis, they can do it in any rule um, or, or a separate policy. Uh, but they're, they're specifically doing it in the MATS rule. Mm. Um, so I, I think if, if, if people think that EPA is not going to be asked now to move forward to vacate the rule, if they uh, re rescind the appropriate and necessary finding, um, th they are mistaken. The Very request well. will come immediately. Mm. Ms. McTeer, Tony, turning to you, what message does it send that EPA is voluntarily taking action to undermine these critically important public health protections? It takes the, makes the statement that the health of our children is not as important to them as the cost to industry. Mm. Yes, the EPA is voluntarily reopening this finding and its action could risk all the progress that's been made in getting dangerous toxins from power plants out of the air. Uh, why EPA is spending time to fix something that doesn't need to be fixed is beyond comprehension. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, Gentlelady. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Guff, Guff, Gustafson, um, my understanding is is that the, uh, the the rules that are being looked at by the EPA currently were actually in the D.C. Circuit being reviewed when the administrations changed. Is that accurate? That's correct. The case is still pending right now, Murray Cole versus EPA. So, so am I correct that the EPA would either have to defend the Obama administration position on the costs or take a look at it? Is that correct? That's exactly right. Uh, so, is it some shock that the Trump administration might want to look at some regulations or the, the impacts of regulations brought about 
in a prior administration? I don't think it's a shock at all. It's perfectly normal for an incoming administration to request that uh, challenges to pending rules be held in abeyance while the agency can re-examine those rules. That's exactly what happened here. And when an agency determines that uh, its prior action is not defensible, it is perfectly within the, the rights of the agency and it's only responsible for the agency to stop defending it and instead to improve what they see as uh, uh, unjustifiable action. That's what happened here. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because the court did, uh, did say the costs uh, had not been reviewed. It's interesting when you take a look at costs, it would appear to me at least that the costs and the benefits that are looked at, we're looking at the co-benefits and the particulate matter and all of that, but um, many areas, including my district, we had four facilities shut down, two were reopened as natural gas, but four coal facilities were shut down, uh, two of those never to be reopened. The cost of the community was huge as well, loss of jobs, loss of big incomes, loss of taxes. Et cetera, et cetera. It, it, wouldn't it only be reasonable if you're going to consider co-benefits? So we're doing the, the benefit analysis to consider the the co-costs or the co-losses in a community as that, well. That's exactly right, and I think regulatory economists would agree that it's only good practice uh, when you're considering co-benefits to also consider corresponding co-costs. Uh, that was not done in this case. The, uh, the, the past administration looked at co-benefits, but it only looked at direct costs. It didn't consider uh, what higher electricity prices and plant closures could do uh, economy-wide. Um, and I think there are a lot of, uh, of important costs that were neglected there. Um, I would point out, though, that the cost-benefit uh, methodologies that have been discussed today pertain to what agencies do in the regulatory impact analysis. That's not changing here. EPA has said it's not proposing to alter the way it reports benefits to OIRA. It's only changing, uh, uh, deciding what it will do for the appropriate and necessary determination in the context of this statute. Okay, and so the, the, it's not like the whole rule is going away, it's just an interpretation on how you do the analysis, is that correct? That's right, this, this rule is not going away. The agency uh, isn't able to take it away under binding circuit uh, case law, New Jersey v. EPA, and um, I'm not aware of anyone who, who intends to uh, petition EPA for a delisting. That's what would be required. Now, my team over here has got a map, and it's a little dated, I, I will admit. It's from like 2006, but you know, I've always thought it was interesting when we talk about mercury. We care about uh, families and we care about families across all matters but does anybody know if this number if this has changed so what you're seeing is all the red area is where foreign mercury is predominantly the cause of mercury in the United States now you do see issues in the east particularly in uh, in my region of central Appalachia and some of the other areas where that that uh, shifts but does anybody know if that has changed or are we still getting a tremendous amount of our mercury from overseas sources Yes, ma'am. I can answer that. Um, we definitely do see these two patterns of domestic mm -hmm. mercury deposition and international mercury deposition happening in the U.S. And, and you're quite correct that a lot of the deposition that we see to the United States um, from U.S. sources happens in the East. That's where many of the major sources are, and that's where many of the populations are impacted from those sources. Uh, we have seen mercury emissions go down quite a bit as a result of this rule. Uh -huh. um, so we have seen declines in deposition. And I think we're all glad about that, but we want to make sure that the cost measures are accurate. One last thing, where should I be looking to get my fish from? Uh, because I eat a lot of fish, and I understand there's a lot of mercury in it. Are you the, who can answer the fish question? Well, I can, I can help you out with, with part of that because that's one of the things that we do at Mom's Clean Air Force okay. is we make sure that we provide our mothers with this information. And so I think you, you uh, ask a very interesting question uh, because certainly uh, mothers that are in the United States of America, we rely on the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to ensure the regulation here in the U.S. is correct, and we've been doing so. And we try to make it really clear so that our moms know when you get pregnant and you go to the doctor and they tell you don't eat the tuna or you're not supposed to eat as much fish, why that happens. And so for our Native American moms and moms of color and people who live close to these water bodies, they need to understand that when they're living right next to that facility, where the fish comes from and how it impacts the child's brain. So that was a really good depiction of what's happening in the East where it's very localized to people. And I really hope that that type of 
uh, information can be shared so that our nation can understand why it's so important for us to be a part of global conversations. Unfortunately, we pulled out of those at this time, but I General hope we can do that. I yield back. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Tony, we'd love to have a copy of that for our committee so we can look at it. Thank yes, you. Absolutely. Chair now recognizes you. gentleman from California, Mr. Peters, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to the witnesses. I'd like to spend a few minutes um, talking about the effectiveness of the mercury and air toxic standards. It just seems to me from what we've heard that by any measure that the Obama era rule has worked, the Trump era's, uh, Trump EPA's 2018 proposal shows that, the proposal itself shows that mercury emissions from power plants have decreased by 86% from 2010 to 2017, and that total air toxics emissions have been cut by 96% during that same period. Dr. Celine, how has this de decline in mercury emissions affected human health and the environment um, and what would you think about putting these standards at risk? Well, yes, as you say, there have been um, a lot of declines in mercury as uh, mercury emissions as a result of this role. Um, we've also seen uh, declines, for example, in, um, in fish in the Atlantic that are uh, occurring at the same time. Um, and we would expect that, uh, that this has substantial benefits um, to human health and the environment in the United States. Um, and the efforts to any effort to roll back this rule would then increase mercury emissions, which would um, would threaten those declines. With respect to Mr. my colleague's uh, chart, Mr. Griffith's chart, which showed the percent of mercury that came from other places, but didn't show the amount of mercury that was being deposited. Would you acknowledge that that's, that's the case? That's true. Okay. And so the fact that uh, a large percentage of mercury in the West may come from foreign sources uh, doesn't reflect the fact that a large, that maybe a lot less is being deposited. And in fact, that we can do a lot for our country, uh, particularly in the East, by uh, reining in the sources um, as the Obama rule did. Dr. Landrigan, you say in your testimony that the mercury and air toxic standards, quote, prevent brain injuries, protect children's lungs, and saves lives. Uh, if we were to lose the protections we have in place now, can you give us a, I mean, you've touched on this a little bit before, but can you give us a general um, sense of the, of what would happen to children in that in that instance? Well, yeah, yes, sir. Thank you for that question. Mercury damages the human brain, and the human brain is most vulnerable to mercury <clears throat> in the earliest stages of, of development, during the nine months <clears throat> of pregnancy, in infancy, and in childhood. So if mercury emissions were to increase because of the cascade of actions that's being initiated through the removal of this, the proposed removal of this provision, uh, the result would be more brain damage in children, lowered IQ, behavioral problems, problems that last a lifetime that cannot be treated medically. Thank you. Um, I want to just observe that in the, the uh, testimony of um, Ms. McTeer Tony, um, a former EPA official, now National Field Director for the Moms Clean Air Force, who are represented here in the audience. Um, she cites, quote, broad opposition to this proposal from not only from parents, children, and grandparents, but also from doctors, nurses, faith leaders, anglers, conservationists, and more. Even the regulatory industry itself opposes this proposal. And I wanted to ask Ms. McCabe um, if public health officials don't want this rule to go away, environmental groups don't want this rule to go away, many states say they don't want the rule to go away, even the regulatory industry does not want the rule to gay, who is EPA trying to help with this proposal? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, I don't, I can't speak for EPA, I don't know, but I can think of two reasons why they would do this. Uh, one is um, that this administration has made very clear that they will do anything they can um, uh, to, to help the coal industry. And this rule is sort of top, top of the list, even though, as you acknowledge, it's been implemented and the utilities are ready to, to move on. Um, the other reason for doing this is uh, to use it as sort of a flagship to inaugurate this new way of looking at benefits, at devaluing the, the full range of benefits. And I would offer the analogy of quitting smoking. If you quit smoking to reduce your chances of getting lung cancer, you are also um, it, it, having all kinds of other health benefits to you and the people around you. And it doesn't, they, affect, it doesn't affect your jurisdictional power to quit smoking that you got other get, it, get other benefits. They come along for the ride. Yeah. And so but can I just real. say, can I just say, just conclude that we talk a lot about a, a number of pollutants in here, but we talk about heavy metals like lead and mercury. Those are the absolute worst things uh, for children. They cause lasting permanent damage 
Uh, we ought not to mess around with those here, and I, I, I oppose this, uh, this awful action by the EPA and yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, Mr. Livermore, a moment ago, um, something was said that um, I wanted to follow up on uh, regarding the cost uh, considerations. Did the EPA consider co-costs when it was finalizing these standards in 2012? Because the suggestion was made that it did not. It did. It did. And is it considering them now? Uh, it's not revisiting its, co, uh, its cost estimate, so essentially, yes. Okay. Um, let me get more into the benefits and cost discussion because that's, that's obviously central here to the, to the um, differing views we have on this matter. Um, and we got to get those numbers right. So, um, Dr. Uh, Seelan, um, Celine, sorry. In your testimony, you state that the assertion by EPA that the MAT standard result in four to six million dollars in mercury-related benefits to the U.S. is out of date and incorrect. And the best available scientific information suggests that the mercury-related benefits that can be quantified are orders of magnitude more than that. In fact, in the billions of dollars, um, your study estimates um, three point seven billion dollars in annual benefits just from the mercury reductions alone. Why is that number so different from the four to six million dollars that's relied on by the EPA? Yes, um, the EPA's estimate is really only a partial um, analysis of the benefits of the math standard. Um, and our estimates are larger for two basic reasons, um, one of which is that the EPA's estimate only looked at um, people who consume fish they catch for themselves in fresh water, and we looked at the whole U.S. population. Um, and the second is we included both impacts on reduced IQ as well as cardiovascular impacts, so reduced heart attacks. Um, EPA only looked at the reduction of IQ in newborns. So you're taking a very broad perspective, which I think is um, the prudent one to do. Um, I also know that um, now that the MATS has been implemented uh, for several years, uh, we have some sense of how much it costs industry uh, to comply. Um, and so, Dr. Livermore, Mr. Livermore, I'm going to come to you on this. According to 2015 analysis, costs of compliance with the mercury standards were about $7 billion less than the EPA estimated in 2011 because we've had a lot of technological improvements. We see this across many industries and actually in many regulatory environments where initially people resist it, they anticipate the cost will be um, uh, overwhelming and, and too burdensome, and then technology kind of keeps it, keeps the model changing over time. Um, so that's uh, that's the technologies kicking in, reducing reduced prices of natural gas and so forth. And in your testimony, you state the EPA's treatment of costs is um, irrational because it fails to acknowledge the overestimation of regulatory costs associated with 2012 MATS rule. So, in your view, how should the how should the agency consider costs now that the rule has been complied with? Well, if the agency actually wanted to look at what the costs and benefits of the rule going forward were, then that would exactly would take into account both the fact that costs were lower than they were anticipated and the reality that most of the costs have already been uh, incurred, and it does neither of those. I mean, I think what we see going on here um, by administration is they're really just kind of picking and choosing. They're not concerned about apples to apples or oranges to oranges, either by category or temporally or anything else. They find a number that works for the argument that they're making or the policy change over here, and then they'll, they'll grab that, and then they'll grab something else to, to advance their position, even if those things don't rationally, um, are not rationally uh, compatible. So uh, they're clinging to these numbers that are hand-picked out of 2011 analysis um, without too much elaboration. Their proposal states that if, uh, even if it considered new information, quote, the outcome of the agency's pro proposed finding here would likely uh, stay the same. Ms. McCabe, it seems implausible that um, the agency can reach this conclusion without even considering this new information. Can the agency, in your view, put at risk up to 11,000 lives a year based only on its guess here that the new information, quote, likely 
wouldn't make a difference? Well, that sentence caught my eye too when I read the proposal. It doesn't seem like the way you should do rulemaking um, to to anticipate what you, what people will tell you and then decide. Um, so better would be to see what people bring forward and thoughtfully consider that. Um, and as we've seen, there is significant new information that would um, uh, uh, that should um, factor into that decision and seems like it would lead to a different this outcome than what they presumed in the proposal. Thank you for that. Um, when the health of the American people is at stake, we ought to pay attention to science. We ought to come up with standards that make sense. We ought to rationally align those. I don't see that happening here uh, with the Trump administration's proposal. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Indiana, Ms. Brooks, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and I apologize uh, because I've been going, coming back and forth from the health hearing, and so want to welcome you, Ms. McCabe. Uh, glad to have a Hoosier on the panel. Um, and with that, I'm going to yield my time uh, to our ranking member, Mr. Guthrie. Thank you. I thank my friend for yielding. I know that there is a drug pricing hearing going on just downstairs from us a couple of uh, levels down. So I want to finish with some testimony that I, from uh, Mr. Gustafson. Um, in your testimony, you note that EPA's 2016 supplemental finding adopted a cost reasonable and reasonable on this methodology as its preferred approach to make it an appropriate necessary finding. Under this approach, the EPA concluded that the cost of mats is reasonable because compliance costs are well within the range of historical variability and that the power sector is able to comply with the rules requirements while maintaining its ability to perform its primary and unique function which is the generation, transmission, and distribution of reliable electricity at reasonable cost to consumers. So my question is, uh, having said that, do you believe that the cost reasonableness test was a, an appropriate response to the Supreme Court's decision in Michigan v. EPA? Why or why not? Absolutely not. Uh, the court in Michigan v. EPA made very clear that a rule is not reasonable, much less appropriate, uh, if its um, costs uh, outweigh the benefits by a substantial degree. Um, and so in order to do that analysis, you would need to know what are the costs and the benefits. The cost reasonableness approach does not look at whether the costs are justified by the benefits. It only asks whether uh, this will be destructive to the industry. Okay, and why do you think the former administration chose this as their preferred approach? I think they chose it because they realized the vulnerability of their cost-benefit estimate um, and they wanted to uh, buttress their uh, finding with an argument that doesn't require a court to look behind and see what, what are the relative costs and benefits. Okay, so and why, in your opinion, did the former administration include both a preferred approach and an alternative approach in their 2016 supplemental finding? Well, I think uh, it was a belt and suspenders uh, approach to the litigation. I think they uh, realized that um, if, if the court were only looking at their cost-benefit analysis under the secondary approach, that cost-benefit analysis was vulnerable to the a judicial determination that it's unreasonable to look at particulate matter co-benefits uh, as equal to the direct benefits of mercury reduction. Uh, and so I think they needed both to try to make it as strong as they could. I think neither of them is an adequate approach. Okay, so this next question kind of gets into where you are and what you said for quite a, some of your answers this morning. But in your written testimony, you note that by ceasing to rely on by ceasing to rely on particulate matter co-benefits to justify hazard air pollution regulation, EPA's new proposal takes an important step toward rationalizing future air quality regulation without actually altering the mercury standard itself. So, can you explain what you mean that this proposal takes an important step? toward rationalizing future air quality regulation? And likewise, do you think the changes, the changes to the appropriate necessary finding will have an impact on future regulation? Uh, I hope so, in answer to the last question. Uh, I think that uh, if EPA, um, I, first of all, I would agree with the panelists who have pointed out that the agency should be consistent in its cost-benefit approach. Um, I think if the agency is consistent about <coughs> uh, what it's proposing here, that it would not include uh, criteria pollutants like particulate matter and ozone in cost-benefit analyses, uh, at least under the appropriate and necessary determination of Section 112 uh, in the future. 
uh, that would be an improvement on the, on the status quo. I think more broadly, it would be appropriate for the agency to consider how it does cost-benefit analysis, even for regulatory impact analyses, although I would point out that that is different from what the agency is proposing here. So circular A A4 applies to that. It does not apply to what the agency is doing here. So you made the point several times this morning that, uh, that dropping the appropriate and necessary standard, making changes to the appropriate and necessary standing won't have impact on the standard. The standard will still, still stand and have to go through a delisting process. Uh, and so in your opinion, that dropping the appropriate and necessary I mean, uh, obviously the standard could be challenged in court as well. So you're saying it ha you could be delisted or could be challenged in court. So you're saying that won't have any impact on the standard, in your opinion? I don't think it'll have any impact on the, the mercury standard. Uh, to uh, the, the court, the D.C. Circuit, which is the court that hears all uh, Clean Air Act rules of na nationwide application, mm -hmm. uh, and which would be the court reviewing this decision, has made clear that um, in order to, de to, to get rid of the standard, you would have to delist the source. It's not sufficient just to say that uh, it's no longer necessary and appropriate. Um, that delisting process is set out in statute, and it's a very, very high bar that uh, I would be surprised if it could be met. Well, not me an attorney. If it's, a, if it's necessary to be appropriate and necessary for the standard, and that goes away, it seems like that would still be a requirement that needed to be, but I um, understand your I testimony. share your instincts on that point, um, but the D.C. Circuit in this New Jersey v. EPA case basically said that because the statute includes a delisting provision that sets out clear standards by which a source can be delisted, therefore the agency does not have, um, uh, does not have jurisdiction to withdraw the rule for other reasons. Gentlelady's time's expired. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Ruiz, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, mercury is clearly a dangerous toxin and exposure to it can have permanent neurological effects for particular small children. In EPA's own regulatory impact analysis for MATS, EPA noted that exposure to mercury can cause a host of public health harms. Dr. Landrigan, your work has highlighted the importance of controlling toxic pollutants like lead and mercury in our environment and the impacts that these pollutants can have, especially on children. So uh, what should the public know about the harmful effects of mercury, particularly on children, and then why this rule is so important in protecting them? Thank you, Mr. Ruiz. So what the public should understand about mercury is that different segments of the population have different sensitivity. And the two groups in the population who are most sensitive are firstly pregnant women, not for the health of the woman herself, but for the health of her unborn child, and secondly, small children, toddlers, and kids in general. And the reason that those segments of the population are so vulnerable is that it's during those periods of life, the nine months of pregnancy and the first years after birth, that the human brain is going through this extraordinarily complex development uh, that is necessary to produce and the... And so what pollution. can happen to their development if they're so exposed? If, yes, if a toxin like mercury gets into the developing brain, through the mother or into the child, it can damage the brain. The consequences are reduced IQ, shortened attention span, behavioral problems. These problems last lifelong, and there is no medical treatment for them. The Thank only you. rational approach is prevention. Thank you. EPA's 2018 proposal claims that benefits of mercury reduction would be between 4 and $6 million per year based on results of a 2011 analysis. However, uh, Dr. Salines, you, your 2016 paper in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Sciences show that the projected lifetime benefits of mercury reductions would be $147 billion to 2050, or an annualized benefit of $3.7 billion per year. That is much larger number than what EPA has said. Can you briefly describe how you were able to determine these impacts? Sure. Um, what we were able to do was actually take into account a larger um, population of people affected. Uh, so we had um, we had an analysis that took into account not only uh, people who were eating uh, freshwater fish, but also marine fish, which is the majority of exposure to the U.S. population. So you had more subjects to have more accurate statistical analysis, and you also compared a uh, a group exposed and a group not exposed. 
Uh, so what we did was we projected the, uh, the impacts of the standards, and we can compare that to what would happen um, without the standards. So in addition to just looking at a broader population, we also con considered um, all adults and uh, cardiovascular impacts, so heart attacks, which is also an endpoint of mercury. Well, $3.7 billion per year, that's much larger than the 4 and $6 million per year. Uh, Dr. Celine's study does not appear to be an outlier. In fact, for example, a study from 2017 in the Journal of Environmental Health calculated the economic cost of methyl mercury exposure in the U.S. to be $4.8 billion per year, and yet EPA continues to rely on the outdated 2011 estimates to justify their proposal. Dr. Landrigan, while the MAT standards control for mercury and air toxic emissions, they also have important additional benefits of controlling particular matter emissions. EPA estimates that the MAT's rule would prevent up to 11,000 premature deaths, 4,700 heart attacks, and 130,000 asthma attacks annually beginning in 2016. And yet EPA seems to be ignoring these benefits in their new proposal. Dr. Langdergen, do you agree that the reductions in particular matter pollution that directly result from compliance with MATS is important for a public health perspective? Yes, I do. Air, air pollution causes disease across the lifespan. Air pollution exposure in a pregnant mother results in increased risk of small for dates babies. In children, it produces asthma and pneumonia. In adults, heart disease, stroke, lung cancer, chronic obstructive lung disease. Thank you. Ms. McKay, was it appropriate for the Obama EPA to consider these benefits in its cost analysis, even though particulate matter is regulated under a different provision of the Clean Air Act than the one that addresses mercury and other air toxins? It was absolutely correct. It followed decades of uh, standard uh, peer-reviewed agency practice uh, to consider co-benefits. And, and I'll just note that uh, in the MATS rule, EPA was not regulating particulate matter. It was regulating toxics. And the technologies that utilities were expected to use to control mercury necessarily also control other air pollutants. Thank you. Given what we've heard here today about the harm mercury can cause, it still boggles my mind why anyone would go out of their way to undermine these standards. I yield back my time. Thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the ever patient Mr. Soto <laughs> for five minutes. And welcome to the subcommittee as always. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to take a few minutes to talk about industry compliance with the mercury and air toxic standards. And just as a first, uh, listening to everybody here in the committee meeting, it's dumbfounding why we would be rolling back uh, standards to protect children and the general public from mercury and air toxic uh, poisoning when industry isn't even asking for it. I mean, it's absolutely an acerb kowtowing to an industry that isn't even requesting to be kowtowed to. I don't even know where to begin. But I'll begin by talking about um, Administrator Wheeler testified before this committee and acknowledged last month that the industry is largely in compliance with these standards. Um, because the power industry has made significant investments in the rule and has urged EPA not to undermine it. So at least we have reasonable actors in the private sector. On March 26th of this year, a collection of associations that represent the power industry wrote in an EPA letter, quote, given this investment and industry's full implementation of MATS, regulatory and business certainty regarding regulations, under the Clean Air Act, Section 112 is critical. We urge the EPA leaving the underlying match rule in place and effective. This was by um, both our rural electric uh, co-ops, by Leuna, IBW, and other unions. Ms. McCabe, are you familiar with this letter and what's your reaction? Uh, yes, I am, and, and I totally get it. I've spent my whole life in state and federal environmental agencies, and the thing that industry wants most is certainty. They want to know what the rules are and that they will stay in place. And what this is doing is injecting uncertainty, potentially years, because if they finalize this proposal, it will be litigated. Um, people will come forward and s try to start the process to roll the rule back, which will uh, create more uncertainty. And they have made these investments. They're either already getting rate recovery on it or they're seeking rate recovery on it. Um, and this just complicates everything for them. So the administration's proposal is, in fact, injecting more uncertainty at a time when we had standards working that were better protection for the public. Thank you. Mr. Livermore, do you agree? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the, um, all this rule does is create uncertainty. Uh, it's, it's, 
It is possible that the rule will be upheld. That's uh, uh, if, if, if the agency moves forward with the appropriate and necessary determination, that's the opinion of some folks. I, frankly, I hope that that's correct, but we don't know that in advance and we're putting the lives of thousands of Americans and the neurological development of our children uh, on the line uh, on that supposition. And this includes the proposal by EPA to revoke the precursor findings for MATS. Yeah, it's a direct consequence of that. And Mr. Livermore, how could we be certain that EPA's proposal will not undermine the existing Mercury rule? We can't be certain. Is EPA voluntarily exposing itself to some legal risk here? Is Absolutely. the federal government at risk of rolling these back? No question that there's going to be a, a, a risk involved. It's very likely to get litigated. Uh, anyone who thinks they have a, a crystal ball and can make perfect predictions about what the D.C. Circuit is going to do is uh, deluding themselves. And in your testimony, you bring up the Peabody coal uh, issue. And what does that mean for industry and public health? I'm, I'm oh, sorry. Miss McCabe. Yep, yep. Yeah, I think that's for me. So, so that's just an example of how industry is presuming that the, the rule is going to go away. Um, this was in a, a proceeding at the Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission, um, and a, a, a Peabody entity commented that the, the industry was overestimating its future costs of MATS compliance because it said this proposal is likely to lead to the withdrawal or the um, uh, rolling back of MATS. So, so it, that's how they're thinking about this. Well, I could tell you these standards and the overall lacks of enforcement of coal ash, one of the biggest producers, is affecting my district and my family's native island of Puerto Rico. We recently sent letters over the last term about the Penuelas uh, Valley landfill in Puerto Rico. Um, and while we're trying to transition away from coal, more and more of that toxic coal ash is remaining in Puerto Rico. And just recently, my district, uh, unfortunately, we had an attempt to import some of that coal ash uh, into Osceola County, Florida. And so I'd like to hear uh, first, I'd like to introduce letters to the EPA that I sent regarding these two issues and uh, would also want to hear from you, Ms. McCabe. Does this put um, my community and the communities in Puerto Rico at, li at risk if we continue to burn coal and have these ashes uh, accumulate? Well, we, we know um, certainly uh, from years of experience and study that coal-fired power plants um, uh, pollute the environment in many ways um, through air pollution of many different kinds of pollutants, um, through uh, water pollution, and through the creation of waste like coal ash. So um, the continuation of these um, facilities um, uh, creates those, those risks in those communities. Ms. McTeer, Tony, I represent a community that has a large community of color, and we also have in Puerto Rico uh, an island of predominantly Hispanics. Is this often the case that uh, communities of color bear the brunt of coal ash? Unfortunately, yes. Frontline and fence line communities are oftentimes communities of color. These are communities that are loaded, located directly adjacent to, right next to uh, coal fired power plants, and are the uh, communities that uh, hit the impact the most and the earliest. I have the letters for potential submission. Uh, Chair now recognizes the ranking member for a few final comments. Just a closing statement. When I did my opening statement, I said I hope we're going to have a, an intelligent discussion on what the issues are and how we regulate and how Congress designed the Clean Air Act and the 1990 amendments. And, you know, with a particular, we have the co-benefits being 99 percent of the cost. So maybe we need to fix that. That's something Congress or 90 needs to look at and doing for. And I think we've had that. The one group missing today is, is EPA, and EPA is Congress's, it's our responsibility, both sides of the aisle, to have investigation oversight, and it would have been helpful had the EPA been here today, and they have said they're going to make themselves available, and we hope that happens because I think it's important for the members to have the opportunity to talk to the EPA and, and the decision-making around this, and uh, so it's my commitment to work with, uh, if we have another date that we can make this work as the ranking member, to work to work to get the EPA here to testify before this committee because that's that's our responsibility under the Constitution for oversight and uh, we need to exercise that. So I thank think, you. I thank the ranking member for those comments and unfortunately, today's hearing is not the first hearing that we've had in this subcommittee that we've had trouble getting the administration to appear. So anything that your side can do to help us because it really it really does um, help complete the record of these hearings. Having said that, I want to thank all of the witnesses for appearing today. This was an excellent panel, an excellent discussion. Um, I'd like to um, insert the following documents with unanimous consent into the record. They've all been cleared by the minority. 
the uh, slides that Ms. McTierce Tony gave us um, about how mercury poisoning works. Um, a letter to uh, Administrator Wheeler dated May 10th, 2019 uh, by a bunch of members of this subcommittee and the full committee. A letter dated April 17, 2019 from the Environmental Law and Policy Center to the EPA. Uh, a letter by a coalition of groups dated March 26, 2019 that Mr. Soto uh, asked for submission to the record. And a letter uh, dated September 5, 2017 from Mr. Soto to um, Administrator Pruitt. I'd ask unanimous consent those all be entered into the record. So order. Madam Chair, there's actually a third letter Okay. Which is the response. So okay, I ask good. unanimous consent uh, for the third letter, which is the response from the EPA. And that's inserted too. I want to remind members that pursuant to committee rules that everyone has 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record to be answered by witnesses that have appeared before the subcommittee. And I'd like to ask all of the witnesses, if you do get those questions, please respond uh, promptly. And with that, the subcommittee's adjourned. Thank you. Good job.